Welcome to Westworld Community Church. We are so thankful we, we you could be home today. We're reading from the Bible. So we're going to read from Revelations 21, verses 1 through 7, from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. That I saw, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. Also, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling in the is with is with humanity, and he will live with the with them. They will be his people and God himself will be his, be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because, previ because the previous things have passed away. Then then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faith, faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirst from the spring of life. The victor will inherit these things, and I will be my God be his God and he will be my son. Okay, so we have a couple announcements this morning. Our next sermon series is going to be chosen. What if you remembered the gospel every day? So that looks like it's gonna be a great series. The first wave of books have sold out already. They are $5 each. If you would like to pre-order a book, you can contact Marilyn at the office. That's office at riceroadcc.ca. We also have an Alpha course starting up. That'll be September 17th. So already now you can start praying, asking God who he would have you invite to this study. Maybe you can journey along with them through it. It's a fantastic study. Highly recommend it if you haven't done it. If you are, um, sorry, if you would like to do that, you can get in touch with Pastor Bernie. That will be discipleship at riceroadcc.ca. And that will be September 17th at 7 p.m. So we'll pray this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come together as a family and do these announcements. And we just ask that you'd be with each and every one of us. You would guide the people to the right Bible study that you want in there. And we give you the praise and the thanks. Amen. 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 Good morning, Rice Road. Uh, I'm Carter. And I'm Grace. And uh, today we will be doing worship. So uh, let's open up in prayer. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day, and thank you that we're uh, able to do worship today and honor you. Uh, thank you just for everything that you've done for us on the cross, and uh, thank you for our hope that one day we will be able to be in heaven one day with you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first song we'll be singing is Open Up the Heavens.
next song we will be singing this morning is New Wine. Well, we're at the end of our six-week series, The God Questions. And of all the questions that I get asked, I don't get asked this enough. It's one of those kind of questions where I think that people think they have a semblance of understanding around what it is to expect, but yet if you ask somebody to draw it or paint it, it's something that they really struggle with, trying to depict what it is that they think this is going to be like. What am I talking about? Well. Let me tell you about what it is that I enjoy dreaming about more than anything else in the world. And that is the answer to this particular question. What will heaven be like? I love to just stop and just think and daydream about what that day will be like when we get to heaven. What are we going to see? What are we going to do with our time? Is there going to be time? These are all questions that I've asked, and, and some of these questions are actually answered in Scripture itself, and then we're going to take a look at those today. So before we start, I'm just going to say, let's pray, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide us through our conversation today, okay? Heavenly Fathers, we enter into this exploration of what heaven is like. I pray that you'd help us to see what it is you've depicted in your word, to give us a glimpse of what it is that we can expect. 
Father, I thank you that you've given us even that morsel to, to look at, to explore, understand, daydream about, and to let our imagination go. I know that it's going to be more beautiful than we can ever imagine. And so as we take a look at the word pictures that you've put together in Scripture, those things that we can look forward to, I pray, Father, that it's something that we would look at and think upon often. That we wouldn't just kind of have this conversation and go, okay, good, I know a little bit more about that. But may it lend us to focus more on the eternal hope that we have that is rooted in you and this gift that you've given to us, which is not only salvation, but the extension of salvation is eternal life with you. So, Father, help us to see through your word what it is that we have to look forward to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we take a look at this particular uh, a glimpse of heaven, I guess, it's depicted in many different portions of Scripture. So, I want you to know that we're going to focus in on Revelation chapter 21 and then the first five verses of chapter 22. But we're also going to skip around to some other passages as well. And we're not going to be able to go through cover to cover of all the different things that it says about it in Scripture, which I'd like to say to you, go look, go research, look a little deeper at the different things that he says that we have ahead of us. But we're going to take a good look at some of the key passages that give us a really good bird's eye view of what it is that we have to look forward to. So, if you'd turn in your Bibles with me, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 21, and like I said, the first five verses of chapter 22. I almost lost my Bible there. Give me a second here. All right, I'm ready to go. That's the passage that we're going to kind of use as our key text, and we're going to keep going back and referring to it. All right? So, put a marker in there, your thumb, whatever it is. Know that we're going to keep back coming back to Revelation chapter 21 and the first part of 22. So what we're going to look at here is the new heaven and the new earth. Now, oftentimes people would say, well, what is that going to look like? And we see different passages in Peter and things like that about how things are going to be burned up. Some people think that everything's just going to be wrapped up, burned up, and then a whole new creation is going to come about. Let's take a look and see what it says in this particular chapter. So if you turn with me, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to look at the first seven verses here just to get us started today, okay? The first seven verses say this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more, because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. As we take a look at this passage, there's a couple of things that come forward. And the first thing that comes forward is this whole new heaven and new earth. And I know that some people have that idea that everything's just going to be burned up, like I said, and everything's going to be started new. But it almost makes it look like there's going to be a reverbering, a reverberation that's going to take place. Is that right? Prefer reverberation? I think so. It's going to be refurbed, renewed, reset, redone. And in that, what he's going to take is not throw away everything that is, but it's like he's going to bring to life all that was. And so what he's going to do is he's going to take earth and he's going to take heaven and he's going to place them back in reset mode into what it is that he originally created as he did in the Garden of Eden. 
And so we're going to have the opportunity to do is experience exactly what Adam and Eve did, the way all things were intended to be, which is exciting because I can't wait to see what that is going to look like, this new heaven and this new earth. I can't wait to breathe clean air, see crystal clear water, whatever it is that it was, we will also have the opportunity to experience. I want to remember that in Romans chapter 8, we touched on this a little bit uh, in the last few weeks, and it's about what the effects of the fall, that point in time when man sinned against God, had on all things and even upon creation itself. And so the decay that we see that's been going on in the world is all a result of that original moment then. And so in Romans chapter 8, it talks about how the earth itself is moaning and groaning and want to be uh, referred back to the way that it was. It's almost like it's going through labor pains. But God is going to take all that away. For as much as we want our pain to be taken away, He's also going to take away the pain of the world that it experiences and the way that it has been abused and the way that things have gone wrong. And we know that through pollution and everything else that it experiences, it wants to be made right and back into its original condition. And that's going to happen. In the second verse that we took a look at, it talked about the New Jerusalem. And this is the second thing that's going to happen. And the inhabitants that are going to be in that moment, at that time, who are going to be in eternity with the Heavenly Father, it says that He is going to create a habitation of humans that will primarily be a part of a singular city. And that city itself is going to be the New Jerusalem. Now, in that, you may go, how are all the people who have ever followed God from history past to current and for as however long we're going to see the future go ahead of us, all these people who are going to make decisions to follow God, how are they going to be able to live in a single city? Keep tracking with me. We're going to see some pretty interesting stuff on that front. But the city itself, as it comes down, it comes down from heaven. And so the world itself is completely refurbished. Everything is made new. And then from that, once all things are done on that level, then the new Jerusalem comes down. And this is the place where God is going to set up His throne, where He is going to reside with His people here in the new heaven and the new earth. And so to see this city come down is going to be such a majestic moment. It's going to be phenomenal. And some of the things that it says about what this city is going to look like and the girth of it and things like that, which are in this passage that we're going to take a look at, is going to just blow our minds. And I can't wait to be able to be a part of that and to see it actually happen. But I love how in Revelation uh, 21, 21 verse 5 it says, All things are going to be made new. Think about yourself. Are you looking forward to being made new? Where you don't have to put up with the aches and the pains and the sores and, and the fear of uh, just all the different things we have around us, the sicknesses and death and everything, gone. Completely laid to waste. None of that will be a part of our future experience because all things will be made new, including us. And we'll take a look at that as well. So the New Jerusalem itself, I want to give you some insight as to what we're looking at here. And so take a look at Revelation 21, verse 8. And verse 8 itself says, uh, sorry, I apologize. This isn't a part of the New Jerusalem, but this piece I wanted to uh, highlight. So stay with me. It says, but the cowards, this is verse 8, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now you go, I thought this was a conversation about heaven. Well, it is. But you can't have a conversation about heaven without helping people realize that not everyone is going to make it. And they're not going to make it if they are any one of these individuals. You know, it's interesting, the, the one that I find is very interesting. I mean, cowards is something interesting, you know, coward, cowardice. That's actually going to nullify you from being in heaven. But it talks about faithless. Individuals who don't place their faith and trust in God 
will not go. If they do not recognize Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will not be a part. It talks about those who are detestable. And it's incredible how broad that term is and how many people may be included in that. But to get to heaven, to experience the things that we're going to talk about, you can't be any of these things. We need to be found faithful, faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and of Him alone. And we've talked about that in weeks previous, about how we recognize that God is real, that His Bible is real, and that He loves us and wants to have a relationship with us now and into eternity. And it's that which we're going to take a look at this morning, is the eternal component. Now keep tracking with me. We're going to take a look at verses 9 to 21, and it says this, Then one of the seven angels, who had held the seven bowls filled with seven last plagues, came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He then carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Arrayed with God's glory, her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with twelve gates. Twelve angels were at the gates. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and yep, you guessed it, three gates on the west. The city wall had twelve foundations, and the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubics according to human measurement, which the angel used. The building material of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the city, well adorned with every kind of jewel. The first foundation is jasper, the second, sapphire, the third, chalcedony, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, carnelian, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprase, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The main street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Now, as we take a look at this imagery, I think it's, only, it's important to look at the girth of this city, the size of it. So when it says 12,000 stadia, what we're looking at is 1,400 miles. Now, we know the kilometers are bigger than miles, and we function in kilometers. So that is the equivalent of 2,253 kilometers. So then I tried to figure out how far is 2,253 from here. So use Google Maps. And I thought, you know what, let's try Saskatchewan. No, nope, that was too far. I came back. What major city might we be able to recognize that would be within that close range? And the city that I found that fit the closest to that particular distance from here is Brandon, Manitoba. Now, when you take a look here, if you were to drive that, it shows that depending on which way you would go, you're looking at approximately 23 hours of driving. That 23 hours means going from one side of that city to the other side, driving. That means that the cubic space within this particular city, because remember, it's as wide as it is long, and it's as high as it is each of those, you're looking at 11,436,248,277 cubic kilometers. That's huge. It's going to be absolutely massive. And so 
to put your mind around that. I mean, we think Toronto's a big city. And then when you put this on the map and you look at how much land that's going to cover, look at all of the provinces and the states that that one particular city is going to cover. It's mind-blowing. And when you think of the imagery and how it talks about how beautiful it is, clear gold walls and all of the foundations, it's going to be quite incredible. So artist depictions, artists have a really tough time trying to paint something or put together an image that fulfills what it is that it says here. But there are some who have tried their hand at it. And so what I've done is I've extracted some of those to try and give ourselves a visual aid on what we might be looking at when we're looking at these things. So here, when it talks about each gate is a single pearl, I mean, when we think of a pearl necklace, we think of these little pearls strewn around someone's neck. This is one massive pearl that we're talking about. And there are three on each side, 12 in total. And on, inscribed on each one of them are the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, in this particular image, they didn't include that. But that is what we have to look forward to, to look at. And it's incredible to think of how big that would be and to move that and the mechanics behind it and all of that. It's God. And he gives us in this world just a glimpse, a little picture of what it is that we have to look forward to. And so when you think of a pearl, you look at it and you go, wow, this is really neat the way it looks. Yeah, that, that's just a, it's a little picture of what it is that we have to look forward to. You look at the foundations that are laid there and they're all there with the 12 names of the apostles on there and the different billion colors that are going to be there. And to look at the size of this thing, of what it's going to be, if each one of the stories in this city were 12 feet high, that means with the height that it's going to be, there would be 600,000 stories. Now we look at the tallest buildings in the world now. We look at the ones in Dubai and in other places and we marvel at the engineering and, and the height. But boy, they will pale in comparison to what it is that we have to look forward to. It is going to be dynamite. And so they give us these images of what we have to look forward to and it's just going to be absolutely beautiful. Here are the foundations, the different colors that I read through and I, I may have tripped up on some of those names, I know that, but the colors are just going to be outstanding. And these are the foundations. These are the things that we're just going to walk upon. I can't imagine how much more beautiful the house itself, the city itself, is going to be. When you think of the foundation of your home, you have cinder block or poured concrete. It's there, it's functional, but it's not really beautiful. It just holds up the rest of the house. This is going to be incredible just to look at initially and to realize, well, that there's more to come than that. Look up. It's going to be beautiful. And so with this, the passage goes on and it talks about different elements of the city itself, one of them being the Lamb's Book of Life. And so with that, if we take a look at uh, the next few verses, look at 22 to 27, it says this, I did not see a temple in it that being the city, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The gates will never close by day, because it will never be night there. They will, be, they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only, what is, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So basically what he's saying is this. The only individuals who are going to be able to experience this, what he has for us, what he's gone to prepare for us, are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. How does your name get there? It gets there when you, by faith, believe that Jesus is Lord, and you believe that God raised Him from the dead. In Romans 10, 8, 9, it says, you will be saved. But you've got to confess that Jesus is Lord. You have to not just believe it, you've got to say it. You have to mean it. You can't, have, you can't use Him to get what you want. You have to earnestly say, 
I believe Jesus is Lord. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. And you will be able to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Then there's the river of life. The river of life, it talks in here about uh, looking at chapter 22, verse 1. It says, Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. This particular river is going to flow right down the middle street, main street. And it's going to be crystal clear. It's going to flow right from the throne, right through the center of the city. And I believe that there's going to be walkways on either side. We're going to look at a passage here that talks about trees that are planted on either side. It's going to be a dynamite place to be. And when you think of a lot of the major cities, you look at New York City, water. You look at Chicago, water. You look at Toronto, water. All of the big cities, people just seem to gravitate towards water. There's something very life-giving about that. And our Heavenly Father knows that. And that is going to be a real centerpiece in the middle of what it is that He's going to create for us as well. Then we take a look at the second verse, and it says, Down the middle of the city's main street, where this water is going to flow, it says, The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations. And I, I remember the first time I read this, I thought, how can a tree be on both sides of the banks? And then I thought, well, it must look like this. Now, I know this is kind of a, a crude picture, but it's one of those kind of things where it would be so huge and so vast that only God could create something. I think this picture here does not do it justice. If you've ever been to Disney World and you've been to the Animal Kingdom and you see the Tree of Life there, it's huge. I think even it will pale in comparison to what it is that God has planned for us in the way of Tree of Life and what it's going to look like. And a part of what it originally was. Because the Tree of Life was in the Garden of Eden. And so as it is going to be there in His holy city, the New Jerusalem, for us to see, there's going to be fruit that's going to come on that tree. It's going to bear 12 kinds of fruit. And so it says, producing its fruit every month. So we're going to have the ability, the opportunity to eat from this tree, which will be really neat. In Ezekiel 47, verse 12, it says this, all kinds of trees providing food will grow along both banks of the river. A glimpse of heaven. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. Each month they will bear fresh fruit because the water comes from the sanctuary, the throne of God. Their fruit will be used for food and their leaves for medicine. So all down that river banks, all along the water there, there's going to be these trees, and they're going to be life-giving trees. You know, it's interesting how, uh, if you've ever been to Aspen, uh, into, the, into the Rockies there, there's these trees called Aspens. I apologize, not to Aspen, but there's trees there called Aspens. And they all turn colors at the exact same time. So when the leaves change color, they all do. And it was one of those kind of things where for the longest time people were like, how can that be and why does that happen? Only to find out that there is a root system that connects every single one of these aspen trees together under the ground. And so as one turns, they all turn. Similarly, I think that when you look at that main street where that water flows down it and those trees line it and you have the tree of life that's going to be over top of that on both banks, I believe that there's likely going to be some kind of rooting system all through the trees that are there. They're all going to be interconnected and they're all going to be bearing fruit all year round. We don't have any trees that are like that, that bear fruits all year round, especially in our climate. But there, there will be. And they'll be there for us. Then it talks about the mountains. Now, it makes reference to one in particular, but it's one of those kind of things where you try and get a, uh, your mind's eye wrapped around what am I going to look at? What is it going to be like? You know, how much of this world are we kind of kind of see 
in the next. And so it makes mention of a mountain in verse 21. Uh, sorry, in verse 10 of chapter 21, it says this, He then carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And so as John was given this image of what we have to look forward to, he was taken up to a mountain, which will exist then, because it's like he was transported to a future time to see what things are going to look like. And in that, he's going to be looking from this mountaintop. I'm not going to say down at this city, because this city is going to be absolutely huge, especially its height. But he's going to be watching it, coming down from heaven as it comes down and lands on the refurbished earth that we're going to be a part of. It's going to be an incredible sight. It makes mention of the sea. When you look at the very first verse in Revelation 21.1, it says that there's going to be no more sea, which would lend one to ask, why not? We just talked about water. We talked about how people love to gravitate towards water, uh, be a part of areas that have it. What is it that will kind of eradicate the sea altogether? Now, here's one person's thought on this particular thing, and I'm sure it's not just one. I'm sure there's others that have done some thinking on this, but the curse that had such a devastating effect on creation, and we talked about that, and we see that in Romans 8, thousands of microscopic organisms became harmful to animal and plant life. As a countermeasure, the sea needed to become salty neutralizing these life-threatening bacteria and preventing our oceans from becoming gigantic, toxic cesspools. And so it gives that feel that the world didn't always have oceans and seas that had salt water in them. And as we continue on in this thought, it says in the new creation, all bacterium will be our friends, for lack of a better term. They'll be restored to their pre-fall state. It could be that the Revelation's description of no more sea means that the oceans will become like fresh water, like the lakes that we experience, the great lakes that we have around us, that there will be no more need for salt water. And so therefore, if it says no more seas, it doesn't mean no more water. It just means that there won't be a need for salt water anymore. Now, our hearts. When it comes to heaven, some people say, well, how do you know there's a heaven? There's something about us that confirms the fact that heaven is a real place. In our temporary world, we've been given this innate build into our lives that God has placed there. And it's a longing for something which is more it, there's subtle proof that we were made for something more. We all feel it. We all sense it. That there's got to be more than this world that we're in. And I know that there are some people, whether they be scientists or atheists or whatever they are, that say, no, there's nothing else beyond this. There is still something innately built into us that God has placed in us. That even in those who are sure that there isn't, there's an element of doubt in and around what it is that they say is or is not. But with this build-in, we, uh, we just feel unsettled at the notion that there's nothing more, but that there has to be more to life than just this. We were built for purpose, and that purpose is to experience the new earth. It's our true home, and this is being fashioned and formed by God himself for us. I have yet to go to a funeral or perform a funeral for individuals, whether the person was a believer or not, they still like to say, and now that person is in heaven. Why? Because they are hopeful that there's something more beyond this. It makes them feel better to know that their loved one isn't just uh, nebulously floating around or ceasing to exist, but that there's actually a better life for them beyond this. But then a few weeks ago, we took a look at something that said, narrow is the way, and wide is the road to destruction. And what Jesus was saying was, is that 
fewer people are actually going to avail themselves to him, place their faith and trust in him than those who are not. And yet we looked at John 14, 6, and it said, Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And what that means is that no one is going to experience heaven. This thing that we innately want to experience, the thing that we have this desire inside to someday have as a result of the, an end of all of this, rest, peace, happiness, no more pain, no more crying, no more... But only some are going to find it. Only those who will give themselves over to Him and allow Him to be their Lord and Savior. Let's talk about our bodies. I'd like to dream a little bit about what our bodies will be like. Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, having an extreme makeover kind of thing, and uh, I'm hoping for that. I'm hoping that I'm not going to have to put up with the aches and pains that I talked about, but I like to be a little slimmer, a little trimmer, a little buffer. But it doesn't say those particular things in Scripture about what we're going to look like. But it does talk about how we are going to experience resurrected bodies. We're going to be made new. Philippians 3.21 has this to say. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that enables Him to subject everything to Himself. And so in the same way that when Jesus came back after He rose from the dead, He spent 40 days back on the earth with His disciples, prepping them, readying them for what was going to be beyond Him. He came back in His resurrected body. And so what He's telling us is that, you know what? You are going to have a renewed glorious body like mine. Now, we're still going to be human. That's not going to change. We will still be human, but human doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, broken or in pain or any of those kind of things. That's not what makes us human. We will still be human, but we will have a glorified body like His when we get there. And I'd like to know with this glorified body if I'm going to be able to walk through a wall or something like that. Wouldn't that be neat? Who knows? I mean, that's just kind of one of those kind of things that I think about when I'm thinking of heaven. Not that that's important, but I think it's interesting to kind of daydream about and think about whether or not we'd be able to do those kind of things. In Romans 6, 4, it says this, Therefore, we were buried with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too will walk in the new way of life. That new way of life is that resurrected, glorified body that we're going to be given. As we get there, all things are going to be made new. Not just a new heaven and a new earth. We ourselves will be made new and will be made in the likeness of His Son Jesus, which I find exciting. Now what about our accommodations? What do we have to look forward to as far as what we're going to live in? You know, I thought about this the other day and I thought, are we going to have homes that don't have roofs on them? Because it's likely not going to rain, or we may not have things like that that we have to contend with. But then, you know, there wouldn't be there'd be something lacking as far as coziness and things like that without a roof. And, you know, I don't know if you've allowed your brain to go there, but these are things to think about, right? What is it that we have to look forward to? When it comes to housing, John 14, 2, Jesus says this, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not... I would not have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. When he makes that statement that I go to prepare a place for you, I really believe that he was talking to the group as a whole when he said that because you can be plural. But I also believe that when he said you, it's no different than, you know, having somebody speak to you and you think that they're, you know, in a setting like this or, you know, when we're in the congregation all together in the room together and you feel as though whomever is speaking is speaking directly to you, even though he's speaking to all the individuals in the room. Similarly, I believe in this moment, Jesus was speaking to the disciples and saying, I've gone to prepare a place for you as an individual. 
as I know you better than you know yourself, as I know your likes and your dislikes, as I know what you would love to experience, I'm going to prepare a place for you, tailor-made for you, for you to experience my eternal rest in. With that, I look forward to, I really look forward to knowing what it is that he has for me, knowing who I am, what is it that he's putting together for me. Dream about that. Daydream about it. Look forward to it. Because he loves you as an individual and wants you to be accommodated as much as possible as a loving father for his child. The other thing is time. People wonder, are we going to experience time there? Is there going to be time or is eternity just going to roll out and life's just going to keep happening? Well, when you take a look at what it says in Scripture, there's a few here. In Revelation 22.2, it talks about how the fruit is going, to be, is going to bear fruit every month. So it doesn't say all the time. It says that there's going to be 12 different kinds of fruit, and every month there's going to be fruit there. You look at Ephesians 2.7, and it talks about the coming ages, time still going on beyond this life. And it even says in Isaiah 66, 23, in reference to what it's going to be like in heaven, it says, and mankind will come and bow down before God from Sabbath to Sabbath, from one Sabbath to another. And so in that, it depicts that there's still going to be time. Time is still going to be going on. I don't think we're going to feel the constraints of time like we do here. It's not one of those kind of things that we're going to fight against but it's actually going to be something that we look forward to. As the fruit changes on the trees, we're going to look forward to the next month's fruit. And then as it comes close to that month and on to the next one, oh, I can't wait for the next month, and different things like that. So time will still be present as it is here. Let's talk about foods. You know, in this passage, we talked about how there's going to be those fruit on the trees and things like that. In Luke 22, 29 to 30, he shares this. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Put all of that together. There's a lot going on there. One, I think it's going to be really neat to sit down at Jesus' table, to sup with Him, to have a dinner with Him in His kingdom. But then the latter part of this, where it talks about how you will sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel, do you see yourself being set up as a judge? Any of us all sitting there around the table with Christ on thrones, judging those who came before us as the nation of Israel? Daydream about that. Think about what that might look like. That's a very strange image but one that he says that we are going to experience as his faithful followers. In Revelation 2.7, it says this, Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. So that tree, the tree of life. And I'm going to say those other ones that are all interconnected with it are there for us to be able to pick the lush fruit off of. I can't even imagine how flavorful the fruit in the original garden would have been. It wouldn't have had any pesticides, no pollution to contend with, any of these kind of things. It is going to be outstanding. I bit into a cherry the other day, and I was just like, oh, this is so good. And then I grabbed a plum, and I ate it, and I found myself just thanking God. I'm like, God, this is so amazing. This tastes so good. Thank you. But then to think of what it's going to be like in heaven, from the tree of life itself, being able to pull fruit down from it and eat it, oh, it's going to be great. How about animals? This is another thing that people wonder about. The question I usually get is, will my dog be in heaven or will my cat or my fish or whatever it is that you have as a pet? To that, I don't have an answer for. But I will show you what Scripture does say about animals. It says this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, The wolf will live with the lamb, 
and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling will be together and a child will lead them. It goes on in the next couple of verses and it says, The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit. Can you imagine? And a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. These animals will be there, but they will be docile. It will be like it was in the garden. Everything got along. Everything lived in a symbiotic relationship. Everything was just beautiful and wonderful. Now, one of the things that I think of here is the thing that kind of comes out more than the animals for me is it talks about an infant and it talks about a toddler. Are they going to be in heaven? I believe they are. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I know they bring so much joy to us that why wouldn't they be? So God in his wisdom is just going to do so many fantastic, amazing things. We can't even begin to wrap our minds around what it's going to be like. How about marriage? Marriage is another one of those things that people ask about. Will there be marriage in heaven? Well, in Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, Jesus said this, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, for some, this may be a real disappointment to you. You may say, but I love my husband. I love my wife. I want to spend eternity with them. You will. If they're a believer and you're a believer, you will spend eternity in heaven together. But will it be in a marital-like relationship? According to Jesus, the answer is no, that we're going to be like the angels. And, and what that means, I'm not sure. From what I understand of the angels, they are uh, genderless. And so will we be? Not sure what's packed into that statement that we'll be like the angels. But just to know what that's going to look like as far as marriage is concerned, it's not going to be. But I believe that God in His wisdom and the way of relationships is going to create amazing, fantastic, rich, wonderful relationships. But if you looked at the passages that we were reading, it talks about how the Lamb, Jesus, is the bridegroom, and we, the church, are His bride. And so the marriage that's going to be there is us with Him, the perfecter. Talk about work briefly. Is there going to be work in heaven? People think, no, I thought we were just going to float around with harps and on clouds and, and sing and sing hymns and beautiful things to God and it's going to be a place of rest. Well, what does it say about work? In John 5, 17 about Jesus, I mean, it says here, Jesus says about his father, my father is always at work, even to this very day. And I believe that there is going to be work for us in heaven. Now, when we think of work, I'm not sure what your work situation is, but you might go, I hate work. I don't like my job. I don't want to do any more work beyond this life. But if you're doing something that you absolutely love, think about that one thing you dreamed about would be your dream job, which you always wish that you could do. And if you did that forever, wouldn't you enjoy doing that? I honestly believe that God knowing us better than we know ourselves, knowing what really drives us and really gets us excited, will have that kind of work for our hands to do. And the work that we're given will be based on what it is that we do in this life. So this life has a bearing on what's going to go on in the next. If you don't believe me, take a look at this book, Bruce Wilkinson. I have a few of these on my shelf, more than happy to lend them out, or even buy one for yourself. It's a small book, quick read, packed with wonderful, rich information about a life that God rewards. And a lot of that is, what is heaven going to look like? And what is the work aspect? What am I going to do when I'm there? It's an excellent read. And then we'll talk about potential. When it comes to potential, will anyone and everyone in heaven be perfect? I know when I was younger, I thought for sure we're going to be perfect. If we have glorified bodies and our bodies are going to be like Jesus, then maybe we'll be like all-knowing like He is. Well... The answer is, we won't be perfect, only God will be. So what does that mean, if we're not going to be perfect? Well, it doesn't mean that we're, it does mean that we're not going to sin, but in that perfection, it means that we're still going to remain finite individuals, but we're always going to be able to progress towards perfection. 
We're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to mature as individuals. We're going to be able to do different things. And, and if there's work to be done, you and I both know that if we just did perfect work all the time, well, then it'd be boring. But if we grow and we develop at our skills and our craft and our instruments and whatever else that we do, whatever else that we learn, then we become intrigued by that. We grow through that process as an individual and in our skill sets and all of those kinds of things. And I believe that there's going to be a continuum of that. And if you read that book that I was talking about, A Life That God Rewards, you're going to see how Bruce Wilkinson breaks that out further into that thought. And so it's something for you to think about that this reset will make us leaps and bounds more mature and complete than we could ever have hoped to have become in this life. There's more to do, more to be had, more developing that's still going to go on within yourself when we get there. So, let's conclude with this. In Hebrews chapter 11, if you turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 13, this is the hall of faith, as it's been dubbed in Scripture. Many people have referred to it that way. But in Hebrews 11, verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, those being these individuals mentioned before this, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw from a distance, greeted them and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. So this city that He's gone to prepare, this new Jerusalem, is exactly what it is that they were looking forward to. We ourselves are looking forward to it too. They didn't see it come to fruition just yet, nor have we, but it's yet to come. Heaven is very real. And I look forward to being there. I look forward to being there with as many people as possible. It is my life mission to bring as many people with me as possible. I understand that I'm not the person who actually can make someone come to know God, but I know it's my role to spread as much seed in as many lives as I possibly can, hoping and praying that they do make a decision to follow Christ so that they can know Him now and into eternity. We have a fantastic future ahead of us. Not like somebody who looks forward to their wedding day. This will be the marriage of the Lamb and His bride, Christ with us. This book here by Randy Alcorn, another really good book on heaven. I encourage you to read it short, but powerful, really impactful. We'll give you all kinds of insight beyond this conversation. And so I leave you with this. This, what we've taken a look at, is God's word for you today. The question is, do you receive it? Now you can receive it conceptually and just say, yeah, okay, that sounds right. I can believe that. Or you can say, no, no, I want to experience that within myself. I want to know what heaven is like, and I want assurance in this life before I leave that I'm going to experience that. Because if you wait until this life is done, you won't have that opportunity. It's not available to you. Now is the time to make that decision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this conversation and this glimpse at what we have yet to look forward to. And I understand fully that this isn't the whole picture. This is just a, a fraction, a portion of what it is that we have to look forward to, that you are going to absolutely blow our minds when we actually experience what you have for us. And I look forward to it. Father, for those that may not have that assurance that they are going to experience heaven in their life, if their life is not lined up with yours yet, God, I pray that they would take this moment to just get right with you. That they would take a moment and just say, God, I am sorry for the sin in my life, the things that I have done wrong, the things that I know are disobedient to you. Please forgive me. And God, I pray that you would be my Lord and that you would lead me in this life and grant me eternal life 
as I make this decision to follow you. And if you've made that decision here today for the first time, or maybe you've recommitted your life to the Lord, then Father, I pray that you would encourage them to speak to the office, to call us here and help us have the ability to help them on their new journey. We love you, Father. We thank you for giving us this look at what we have to look forward to. Continue to build up these ideas, these images in our minds, and grant us more to look forward to, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the last song we'll be singing is the Revelation song.